a place, they fall down two or three rungs. Have a look at this young elephant chasing the impala around. <laughs> what a brave boy. <laughs> All right, let's get a little bit closer to these elephants so that we can actually see them and they're not just these distant gray pixelated dots on your screen. So what we'll eventually try and do is re-establish a sighting with that mating pair of lions, one of the Inkahuma pride females and one of the Birmingham boys, which is, looks like they've been mating for quite some time actually. Have a look at this. This is a young elephant who is busy trying to feed on this variable bush willow. Now quite often what you see is these elephant, the remnants of feeding on these branches, they just eat the bark of these trees. You can actually see just to the left hand side of that elephant, there we go, just there is some branches that have been debarked by chewing on them. There we go. That is a branch that's been chewed on by an elephant. They spend hours literally just chewing the bark off of sticks and while volume, by volume weight it doesn't make much sense when you need to eat 500 pounds of vegetation in a day, they definitely this time of year get a lot of their minerals and vitamins from eating bark like that. The interesting thing about this particular, oh, hang on wait we'll come back to that in a sec, don't worry. There is a cow that is missing a tusk. Have a look at that. And funny enough, that's the second elephant in this herd that I've seen that's missing a tusk. Now, elephants can be born without tusks. It's not that common to see tuskless elephant in the Kruger National Park. You do get it. It's not that common that you see it. Quite often what happens is that they break their tusks off feeding. So they use their tusks as tools to pry open bark and to break sticks and such. And quite often you find elephants breaking their tusks off. There's a famous story of one of the Kruger's current giant elephant. He was the longest tusked elephant in the world until recently. And in two seasons he broke off first his one tusk, then his other tusk. And there were these giant, giant tusks. You can do yourself a favor and go and look up Duke. D-U-K-E, and have a look at how magnificent this elephant was before he broke his tusks off. He's still a magnificent elephant, just only with not much tusks left. Anyway, back to, yeah, so. Sorry, Rebecca, I'm just going to have to ask you to go again with that question. Excuse me. It just, we've been asked quite an interesting question by a viewer, and it's about elephant tusks. And I just want to get the exact details. HKP, good afternoon. You've asked me an interesting question. That you've, you've noticed that elephants in India don't seem to have tusks, while the elephants in Africa have tusks. Is there a scientific reason for this? Um, quite simply put, the elephants in, in India also have tusks. The fact that they don't have tusks is either through inbreeding, where they just get where they're breeding tuskless animals with tuskless animals just to take out a danger element all the tusks are actually and have been removed or blunted to a point where they don't create such a hazard for their handlers not forgetting that Indian elephants have a long history of domestication in India whereas in Africa they have almost virtually no um, history of domestication in, in, in Africa whatsoever Alright, Jamie has also found some elephants. One is busy pushing down a tree, so before that finishes, see you later. What a lovely way to occupy ourselves on a Sunday afternoon. I think it's a Sunday. Yes. It is a Sunday. Thank you, Dave. Confirmation that it is, in fact, a Sunday. And a, absolutely, what a beautiful way to spend any afternoon, but certainly a Sunday, Sunday afternoon, and with a herd of elephants in this young female is very intent on demolishing what is left of this poor acacia tree. 
She's used her foot to bend it forward so that she can reach right up to the top. Because she's not quite full grown yet. In fact, she's a way off being fully grown. Twisting that amazing trunk around to pluck away the freshest of the leaves. You can actually probably hear the wind howling. And as most of you know by now, this windy weather does tend to unsettle all of the animals out here, especially things like elephants. Oh, that's quite the contorted position you've assumed, madam. Very impressive. It's amazing to watch them feed this way because you know that they can't see what they're feeding on at that angle. Oh, are we done with that acacia? Not just yet. A little bit of a blind spot underneath their faces or underneath their noses. Everything is done by feel and by trunk movement. And of course by smell as well. I'm actually going to, since she has presented us with this view, I think I actually might... Oh! What's wrong, guys? I'm getting cross over there. Noises of irritation from the rest of the elephants at the back. In fact, this whole herd is going to slowly make their way in our direction. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to reposition... Oh, goodness! Who's having a tantrum now? Sounds like one of the young elephants squealing away at the back. Now we've seen over the, the last few months and years just how vocal elephants can truly be. They have an incredibly wide range of very expressive sounds. The one that they're best at is the sort of squealing, screaming, trumpeting sound whenever they are upset at something. Hello, you two. A young female has been joined by a friend. And the nature of elephant herds means that it's a cousin, or perhaps, no, probably not a sister, because they're right sort of a similar age, but definitely a cousin. And the females and their youngsters will all be in some way related to each other, or most, almost all of the time they will be very closely related to each other. sitting listening to the sound effects trying to gauge exactly how large this herd actually is it feels as though I can hear elephants in a 180 degree arc in front of me and this is exactly around where Aubrey had the last tracks for Karula and while we pos reposition to get ourselves a better view of our lovely elephant herd let's go back across to the man himself who also has elephants for you This elephant has taken with him a little bit of a snack from that tree that he was busy eating. Young male elephant, probably if, if he's going into his teens it would be a lot. I probably think that he's between 9 and 11 years old, somewhere around there. And he's just using his trunk to put that stick that's probably about the diameter of my wrist into his mouth to chew the bark off. Oh, look, there he goes. Let's follow him a little bit and see where he's going to. Oh, there's an enormous kudu that's come out of the bush in front of him. Have a look at that. Ah. Massive southern greater kudu is what you just caught a glimpse at over there with their big corkscrew horns. Let's see if we can get forward a little bit and see if we can get a nice view. Probably one of the most majestic kudus, or one of the most majestic antelope that we find in this particular area. Absolutely worthy of trying to have a look at. There's actually two of them here. I'm in a battle to get a good view of these guys, but let's see. Ah. Just getting little glimpses. It's so difficult to try and 
work the camera and try and get into a good position for these guys. Let's see if we can go forward a little bit over here and get them across the valley. Might find with a little bit of height, it's a bit easier. This time of year, they're almost entirely the same color as the bush. There you go. Have a look at that. Isn't that magnificent? Big 500 pound animal. That's a male with his corkscrew horns. Females don't have horns. And then he disappears into the bush. Well, at least we got to see them nice and, well, a pair of them nice and quick. Now back to the elephant, I think. What do you think, Jean-Dre? All good? Trying not to reverse Jean-Dre into too much foliage. This particular area where we are in now is quite close to Chitwa Chitwa Dam, which is another pretty large water body that we have out here, large enough to support some hippopotamus. And as such, the animals moving to and from this water do an extensive amount of damage to the trees and to the bush around here. So we've got these elephant right in front of us. I don't want to spook them as we come around the corner. Let's see how they enjoy us here. So what I'm looking at in terms of elephant behavior is I'm looking for that tail cock. So the tail needs to stay hanging down straight and then I know that they're relaxed. So that elephant just lifted his head up slightly and because of that I stopped the car. This is also a youngster. using that prehensile trunk of theirs to great effect to reach deep into plants that otherwise would be pretty much unreachable considering these animals needing to take care of their eyes and take care of sensitive parts. They stick these trunks of theirs into a lot of places, grabbing things. Right, into a bit of a different position over here. Let me see if I can straighten us up. These elephants, quite a small herd, this not a very big herd. Not uncommon for elephant herds to only number a few individuals, usually between 8 and 12. But it can, you know, you don't find or you can find herds under six quite easily. There looks to be five members on the left hand side of the road where you're looking at now, and another member or two on the right hand side of the road. And they just slowly feeding down this drainage line. The drainage lines are where the greenest, lushest vegetation is. The drainage line is pretty much exactly that. It's a depression where water can collect and flow when there is lots of water around. And it just drains an area, flows for a little bit, and then stops again. Like a creek, I suppose. These young elephants now feeding for probably close to 24 hours a day. Not quite 24 hours every day, but on some days certainly they will feed almost all day. Sleeping a couple of hours a night. In summertime, some elephant will sleep six hours a night. But sometimes even more than that. But nowadays, in the dry season, needing to eat a large portion of material. Here comes another elephant through the bushes here on the right hand side. This was one of the members that was left over. Ooh, let me try and get myself out of the way over there. You definitely don't want to be staring at me for too much when you've got elephant to look at. <laughs> you can see once again just constantly busy putting food in the mouth. Let's see if we can guess if this is a female or a male. Remember, we look at the profile of the head. If it's rounded, it's a male. If it's angular, it's a female. 
Let's see. What do you think? Now, it'll become all too obvious in a little bit as soon as the elephant comes out more into the open. But just see if you can guess using the profile of the elephant's forehead. If it's rounded, it's a male. If it's angular, it's a female. And yes, this is definitely not an easy question. <laughs> Hello Annabelle, and you're only six years old and watching the show, and I gather because you've got recent memories of your own teeth falling out, you've asked me, do elephants' teeth fall out the same as ours? Yes, in actual fact they do. Where we get two sets of teeth, elephants get six sets of teeth. So can you imagine the tooth fairy visiting you six times for the same tooth? That's what happens with elephants. And they get their last set of teeth when they're 45 years old. Can you imagine? 45 years old. From when they're 1 years old all the way to 45 years old, they get six different sets of teeth. Their tusks, they get two sets of tusks. So two different types of teeth in an elephant's mouth. You've got the molars, which if, if you take your tongue and you run it to your back teeth, the flat teeth at the back of your mouth that you use to crush your vegetables with, if you eat vegetables and are a good girl, here, those are your molars, there. <laughs> Elephants get six of those, and they get two of these. Their tusks are just modified incisors, these here, and they get two of these. We only get one set, they get two sets, and six of these. Sorry, I'm, I'm mistaken there. They get two the same as us, a baby pair, milk tusks, and a adult tusk, and then they get six sets of molars. Let's go forward a little bit. These two elephants in front of us are quite big when they're close by. The one on the left doesn't look that comfortable with us, but we're going to try and sneak up. I'm going to constantly just be watching that tail. A tail is what's going to tell me what mood this elephant is in. I'm just going to take it easy. You can see, didn't even bat an eyelid. Now, you might notice, and I'm going to show you when we get to the front of this tree here, that the elephant walking here, the one closest to us at the moment, has a certain wetness under his tail and that's because he's got a runny tummy. Now, elephants get sick just like we do. And this particular elephant has got a runny tummy, not quite like we get, but you can see the wetness there under the tail. And that's because they're eating so much different plant material at the moment, so many different types of leaves and leaves and twigs that sometimes they eat some leaves and twigs that give them a bit of a runny tummy and they have to eat them because they're the only plants that are available right now in the drought and this sometimes upsets their tummy if they eat a little bit too much of it and I could almost imagine that this elephant has eaten a little bit of too much of tambuti a tambuti tree out here in summertime elephants cannot eat it when it's flushed full of green and it's healthy it is a little bit too toxic for elephants to try but in dry times at the end of the dry season when there's nothing much else around they will eat tambuti and that gives them that runny tummy that you see now they also can get a virus the same as us it's not just related to them eating something funny they can get sick in the Kruger National Park there's a very healthy veterinary science department but while they will help elephants that have been obviously wounded or have an obvious sickness that they don't know anything about, they'll try as much as they can. They can't possibly help every single animal in the Kruger National Park. You can do yourself a little sum here in that the Kruger National Park is some three and a half million hectares big. 
and the average amount of animals across the park is one animal for every oh hang on wait let me think about like here it is 10 animals per hectare is the density of mammals across the park and that is inclusive of everything hey mice and bats and all that in some areas in Africa you can go up to a hundred head of animals per hectare places like the Ngorogoro crater in Tanzania and in some parts of Tanzania during the migration period you will go up to a hundred head per hectare that is an immense amount of animals I'm gonna go forward a little bit again let's see if we can reposition ourselves in a slightly better view for you Not really. The best view we're getting is straight of the back side. So I think what we'll do is we'll move on. Let's leave these elephants to their eatings. What is nice here is we run slap bang in the middle of this herd of male impala, this bachelor herd of impala, and lying down in this bachelor herd of impala is a water buck. Full, a full grown male, but not as big as what they can get. Characterized by those horns, and that white muzzle and the grey skin. These male impala really are being silly. All different sizes here. That impala's got slightly uneven horns. Could have bumped it as a youngster. Could also be a birth defect. Generally speaking, horn deformities happen when impala damage the horn bed that their horn grows from. Not always from birth defects. lovely once again I know these are all males because they all have horns bachelor herd of impala not uncommon usually only during the rut and just before the rut and then again just after the rut this is now two months after the rut but just after the rut for a short period and then they will rejoin the herd again all the females are, or most of the females are pregnant right now and what will happen is as their bodies are changing with childbirth mother nature what mother nature does is they bring all the impala back together up on more grid. eyes and more ears therefore allow for greater protection of those females Hello there. He's driving past. I like saying hello. Alrighty, and off we go again to try and see if we can find these lion. They were moving a little bit when they were mating. The female would get up and she would move about 50 yards every time she needed to mate to the male. And that means that they're going to be, and this was happening every 10 minutes or so, and that means that they're going to be, I'm predicting they're going to be further away from where we left them this morning. Hopefully still on Juma. We were right on a boundary. The 
before that, we've got a un- well, not a unique, but we've got a nice opportunity to watch some vultures fly up into the air. Vultures use thermals to fly. And because it's been so cold and overcast for the whole day, they haven't been able to fly at all. Now that it's starting to open up a little bit, they are able to fly. And you can see them wheeling about, using the thermals to get lift. A big heavy birds, and so flapping to that height is not feasible. They'll just burn too much energy doing it. So what they do is they use wind currents and their large wings to basically get into a pocket of rising air and then circle within that pocket of rising air until they get to the height that they want or until the air starts to cool down enough that it doesn't lift and then they fly to the next one. I must say, judging from the speed these clouds are moving, they are motoring up there. There's, they must have their driving goggles on. It's the fastest I've seen vultures flying around in a long time. <laughs> Giving Jandre some proper practice. It's also a fish eagle that's busy circling there with them. Alrighty, and while we are now en route to the lions, Jamie has got some elephants that she wants to show you. I do indeed have something that I want to show you. It is this elephant's tail for the moment. And that is because, of course, you can never underestimate the importance of looking at an elephant's tail. First of all, because it's a really, really useful mood indicator in terms of gauging exactly how that elephant is feeling. If you are looking for the signs carefully enough, an elephant will tell you exactly how it's feeling. So that gentle swishing tail is a clear indication, as well as the, the scent of him that's just washed over us. He's obviously feeling perfectly relaxed. But that swishing tail is one of the key indicators in determining an elephant's mood and tells us that right now, he is relaxed without a care in the world. His tail going backwards and forwards. And it's amazing, you watch that tail, and even if you are perfectly within a comfort space of the elephant. Sorry, I lost my train of thought there completely. Oh, and now I remember what I was going to say. Even if you are perfectly within their comfort zone, and they, they don't feel uncomfortable with you, or you're edging towards where they become aware of you but are not too concerned, that tail will tell you exactly at what moment the elephant has realized that you're there. Now that might not apply terribly much when you are driving in a vehicle, but when you are on foot it can be one of the key indicators if you ever find yourself around an elephant and you want to know. Because elephants are clever. They often pretend to feed when they are not actually eating. He, on the other hand, is absolutely not pretending to feed. He is quite contentedly devouring what remains of that buffalo thorn. And James Dugan, he wants to know which trees elephants will start to strip first and which ones they go for in terms of nutritional value. They generally avoid the guari bushes and they it, it sort of depends upon which particular trees have the most amount of nutrients, that, which in turn will depend upon the season. Now, buffalo thorns are always of good value, but elephants are not overly fussy about what they go for. You know, anything from tambourtes, I've noticed them eating a lot of combretum trees, and more important than what species they eat is what part of the plant they're going for. And at the moment, bark and root systems seem to be what the elephants are focusing, along of course with the leaves which make up the, a large percentage of their diet. So while we've been watching him, he's actually grabbed and uprooted part of a, what looks like what remains of that poor buffalo thorn. I think that buffalo thorn is pretty much done for. And he's actually taken the main stem and crunched away along the bark because that of course is where the cambium layer lies. So, so it depends on the time of year. In spring, knob thorns are the first ones to get their new and green leaves. So those will be the trees that they go for first. Hello boy. And that will be particularly noticeable this year. 
what you got there? I think you finished that stick. I think that's all done. Oh, well, maybe not. You might have missed a piece of bark. Fair enough. No, I think you got most of it. We're going to investigate, nevertheless. It was just so good the first time round. I think he's going to have a second go of it. Knob thorns will be the first thing they start to eat in spring. Then they will start to target the marulas as they get their leaves back. The buffalo thorns and the bush willows are what they've been feeding on recently. And then a whole host of other, especially the acacias as well. Buffalo thorns, combretums, so the bush willows and acacias is what I've noticed the elephants are eating right now. Dave, I'm going to do, oh, I think it's going to go, I'm going to do something horrible. I really want to get this crombeck on camera. It is sitting, there's a fallen down tree and then there is the upright tree, not quite so far back, come a little bit further to the right. He's hopping on that upright tree, little skinny upright tree, right in front of you. Go for uh, yeah, you zoom in. A little bit to the right. There is, there is, in the center. There we go. Yay! <laughs> Sorry, I've been dying to get this little crombeck. Yay, well done, Dave. I know that was, that was a really difficult spot there because that little bird was hopping up and down. I don't know where it's gone, but we had the briefest view of one of the most difficult birds to get on camera, which was a long-billed crombeck. Nope. No, I don't know where it's gone, Dave. You're very brave to keep trying. I've completely lost it. <laughs> it was part of a bird feeding party, and it's one that I've been seeing recently. There's one that's been hopping around camp, and every time I see it, I think I've got to get that one on the list for some of our viewers. So for new viewers, we encourage all of our viewers to keep a bird list. So list each and every bird that you get to see and identify. Hello, boy on our live safari. Sorry, I didn't mean to detract from your magnificence. Alright, I think we're going to reposition ever so slightly. Most of our elephants have moved off. I haven't heard any further trumpets. I did hear a couple of upset sounds coming from in this block. So the vegetation off to my left, which is where I think that Karula might be hiding. I'm going to go try and reposition. Just double check because then a squirrel started alarm calling a little bit further away from the elephants. And my thought, it didn't sound frantic enough for a leopard, but I'm hopeful, I'm always hopeful, that she might have decided to pop out. And also I'm not quite finished looking at our elephants just yet. I want to get a nice view of them. guys. Mind if I come join you? Now for newer viewers I must sound completely mental whenever I draw up next to elephants, whenever I pull up next to elephants. So I always start talking to them in a very calming tone and it's, I promise you it's not because they understand the words that I'm saying but it's something that I've found most guides do and it happens I don't think we consciously realize that, oh, look at the little baby. Sorry, distraction. Hello, little one. Hidden behind the big male. I wonder if that's not Benjamin Button. Again, that might sound ridiculous to new viewers, but when you see Benjamin, you will understand. Is that Benjamin? I think it might be. Oh, no, it's definitely not Benjamin. That's a girl. That's a female calf. She's lovely, nevertheless, and we will try and get another view of her because there's nothing cuter than a baby elephant. Benjamin is a male calf that we've called Benjamin Button because he has the wrinkliest forehead of any baby elephant any of us have ever seen. Oh, that baby is minuscule. A couple of months old at best. Oh, there goes mommy. There goes mommy. Wait, mommy. You are too cute, little one. 
there we go. We have a question on the subject of elephants' wrinkles. Lauren wants to know why they're wrinkly. Well, there's a couple of theories behind the elephant's wrinkly skin. Uh, the biggest one being, <laughs> biggest quite literally, is because of their surface area to volume ratio. So by having wrinkly skin, they increase their surface area and therefore increase the surface area to volume ratio in order to help with heat dispersal. It also means that when they go and roll, when they cover themselves in mud or when they splash themselves with water, particularly, I mean, it doesn't really apply so much on these winter days, but in summer when the temperatures get up to over 45 degrees Fahrenheit or when you're sitting above 110 degrees Fahrenheit each and every day, sorry, centigrade and Fahrenheit, I'm now completely confused, I spend too much time converting, but when you think about how hot that must be, for us, imagine being a five-ton elephant and how uncomfortable they get. Now they've got those incredible ears to act as a cooling system. But when they splash mud and water over wrinkly skin, the water and the mud gets trapped in the wrinkles themselves and it takes a little bit longer to evaporate. So it basically extends the cooling effect that those measures have. It's a really valuable way of helping to make up for the fact that they are as enormous as they are believe it or not. And then of course they've got those amazing ears. There's also a great deal of elasticity to their skin, which makes sense when you think about how large they are and then each movement is correspondingly as large. They're bending their knees and their ankles, and moving their shoulders, all of that is a large movement for a big elephant and their skin has to be up to stretching that amount. Now there's a couple of different reasons why elephants have such wrinkly skin, but the heat and the strength of the African sun out here is one of the big reasons. I want to go, I think, that, that the female with the calf is going to come out into the road ahead of us. So let's go that way. Last night, I know that Steph had that incredible sighting with young Benjamin, the elephant calf with the wrinkly forehead that looks like an old man. On our way home, Jandra and I also had a really, really special moment with him. We were on our way back from Arethusa, so it was after the close of the sunset safari, and Benjamin decided he was going to try and climb over a fallen apple leaf tree. So he got his front feet over, this is now in the dark, so I'm sort of watching, we have to keep your lights on so you can see what the elephants are doing. I couldn't get past and obviously I didn't want to push them off away from me. So I watched this little thing. He puts his front legs over the tree but he got stuck in the middle. So he had the, the tree on his belly with his back legs on one side and his front legs on the other and he couldn't get over. It was so cute. Oh little thing. You are so cute. Hello baby, hello baby, oh look at mom, look what mom's doing, oh she's got up now. I really, really cannot get enough of watching baby elephants. They're always busy doing something, busy learning, busy fiddling with their trunk and they're fascinating to watch because it's like watching a Oh, look at this bull. Oh, be careful. You're going to get into trouble. Mommy was not impressed with that. And look how cheeky the little calf is. <laughs> My mommy's going to show you. Oh, little calf, you're going to get that bull into trouble. No, you can't suckle from him. That's not going to work. That's very interesting. That is behavior. I think that's the first time I've ever seen a, a, an elephant calf try and suckle from a male. It's really fascinating. It is definitely a male. Hmm. Not, I can actually hear it making sucking sounds. Well, that is an absolute first for me. And that young bull, that young elephant bull that that calf just tried to suckle from, he knew 
that he had to tolerate that because otherwise he would have been in big trouble. And recently we saw a display of what a female elephant can do to a young male. It was actually Benjamin's mom who turned around and pinned during one of our sightings. An elephant female turned around and actually flattened a young male onto the ground and held him down despite his squeals of protestation. We still to this day don't know what exactly what it was he did to provoke her. But how interesting was that? That young bull didn't even think about trying to move the calf. Amazing. Elephants are amazing. What is she trying to break there, Dave? Sorry, the female on the right. Oh, hold on. Oh, uh, she stopped doing it now. She had something underneath her foot. And you, mister? Oh, sorry. That's a female. Hello, girl. What have you got to say for yourself? Hello, girls. It wasn't a young bull, sorry, that makes a lot more sense now. It wasn't a young bull, it was a young cow. So that makes complete sense why she let that calf come and attempt to suckle. Even though she's too young, she's learning her mothering skills already. And the young females in the herd do practice babysitting. I still have never seen a calf suckle from a, a sort of a pre pubescent female before. It's still a first for me. Our little calf has managed to find mom and is currently exploring its world. Now we've heard lots and lots. <laughs> what is that thing on your end of the f your face, baby? How does it work? <laughs> Waving it around like that. <laughs> Sorry, got distracted. Michelle actually has raised a very good point, and that is, will the elephants become more aggressive with each other now that access to food is limited, or food resources are limited? Yes, to an extent they will. And I'm distracted again. Sorry, let's just go back to this elephant behind the little one. It's got back, it, it's picked up what the, the, the mother of the calf was trying to get. Um, sorry, not that one, Dave, the one to the left. It's playing, currently playing football with some kind of tuba. Yeah. What? It's got some kind of, again, we've, we've been speaking about this in camp amongst us as guides, trying to work out exactly what this tuba is that these elephants dig out of the ground. It's huge. And this one is no different. And the, the mother pulled it out, but it's been taken over by another elephant. It's now... Attempting, I think, to break it up, break it open with her feet. Interesting. I don't know. Sorry, Michelle. <coughs> you have asked a really salient question. And yes, to an extent, the elephants will be more on edge. They might not take it out on the other members of the herd. They might, well, they might actually, with the young males in particular. The young males tend to bear the brunt of the female's stress levels. They often are pushed around, and I'm, I'm not talking babies, I'm talking young males that are almost at, have almost re reached sexual maturity and are on the outskirts of the herd. They definitely already are showing signs of being slightly more, I wouldn't call them aggressive, but they are definitely more on edge with each other and with us and with other animals. And they've been chasing animals away from the waterhole for months now, whenever they come through to have a drink. That's relatively common elephant behavior, but we're seeing it more and more frequently. They're not keen on sharing what limited resources are left. And they will become more stressed because they've got to walk further and further to get to water. It's going to start getting hotter and hotter. And at the same time, they're going to be stressed out by the lack of nutrients that their bodies are struggling for. What are you trying to do? You're, trying, you're, not, an, you're not a leopard. You can't climb trees. That's not going to work out. You can roll forward a bit. I hope I can. I don't think I can. Oh, good. 
school. It's okay. It's okay. It's all right. And welcome to Johnny who is eight years old and is a new viewer. It's really wonderful to have you on board. Now Johnny would like to know a little bit more about the lifespan of an elephant and how many teeth they get and so on. And Johnny, we're gonna we're gonna keep I'm gonna keep answering your question, but we're gonna watch this little baby while we do, just because she's so incredibly cute. Now, uh, Johnny, an elephant can live between 45 oh 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 where are you going? <laughs> Sorry, Johnny. What was that all about, little one? Running for the protection of your babysitter. Oh, you're so cute. Little baby. Sorry, Johnny. So this little one, when she grows up, she could live, she'll probably live on an average of 45 years, but they can live all the way up to 60 years old. <laughs> I hope you're getting some magic screenshots, by the way. And the amazing thing, Johnny, about elephants' teeth is because they have to eat all the time. Imagine having to eat all the time, constantly, constantly having to chew. And because they have to do that, their teeth wear down really quickly. And what that means, an elephant only has four molars in its mouth. So two... <laughs> Where's mommy? Where's mommy? Panic! Back to mommy! There's mommy! Okay, there's mommy. You feel better now. You're getting very brave, little elephant. <laughs> that was a long way away from mommy. But you made it back. All is well. How amazing was that behavior? Sorry, Johnny, I promise I'm going to answer your question properly in one moment. But how amazing was that behavior? Little baby runs to what could well have been a big sister or a an older cousin. Older cousin intercepted little baby, made sure that she was safe, and then little baby went running back to mom. And little baby elephants get bored. They're intelligent, they're learning, and they don't need to eat as frequently as the adults do because they are provided with the nutrients that they need through mom's milk. That's why they are so thoroughly entertaining. Okay, Johnny, sorry, just too much going on. So Johnny, really, really good question because elephants' teeth are fascinating. First of all, their tusks are modified teeth, but that is one permanent set of teeth. They will always have those tusks. Once they start growing, they will keep growing throughout their lives, and they are modified teeth, even though they don't look like teeth. Then, inside their mouths, they've got one molar on the top on the left, one molar on the top on the right, and one molar on the bottom on the left, and one molar on the bottom on the right. So they've got four molars, and they continue to chew those mol on those molars until... So we've got, just to give you a comparison, Johnny, I'm not sure how many you've managed to get of your permanent molars, but we've got far more than four in our mouths. And they will chew until those molars are ground right down to the gums, and then the next set will move in from the back and replace it. And elephants go through six sets of molars. So the, the teeth keep replacing themselves every time until they get to the number six set of molars. So the sixth time that they replace their teeth, at which point they've got no more teeth to replace it. So when they're about 45, oh, back again, back again. Oh, I'm so brave. I'm so very brave. Watch me, Mom, I'm exploring. <laughs> Mom, not at all concerned. Look at me, look at me, Mom, I'm being a big elephant. I've got a big stick in my mouth. Hello, Mommy. Your baby's beautiful, girl. Your baby is really beautiful. A clever girl. Oh, this is a tricky obstacle when you've got little leggies. <laughs> 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 
Are we having a great time in the sand on the road? Is this just the best thing that ever happened? It's like a trip to the beach. Oh, I've seen Mom and the other elephants take trunkfuls of this stuff and throw it on them. Oh, who's this now? Do I know you? Am I afraid or am I... Do I know? Yes, I know you. I know you. I know you. I recognize you. Hello. Will you feed me? <laughs> Again, suckling from one of the young females. Nope, that's not working out for you, is it? Really gentle discouragement there. Very, very gentle. Just the slightest block with her leg. No. Hear that trumpeting again. Oh, going in again. Oh, no. No milk there. I've been fooled. Mommy, I've been fooled. Here we go. Back to the safe. There we go. That's the right idea. Hello, little one. That's your mommy, yes. <laughs> Oop, bonk. Oh, straight into mom's leg there. Hi, big girl. You're doing a lovely job of babysitting. Yes, you are. I'm not a threat. I'm not a threat to the baby, don't worry. It's okay. The elephants are talking to each other. Very, very soft, deep rumbles that I keep hearing. And I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I am starting to think that it's because they've bumped into Karula. Look at, the, look at the body language. See the change in the body language. They're picking up on something. And this young female is making sure that it's not me. But whatever it is, it's unsettled all of them. The adults are taking it slightly better than the youngsters. There's some really interesting behavior happening here. They're still relaxed, but they're just, there's just a slight change to their behavior. And that trumpet that I heard from in there could well be that they've encountered Karula. Oopsie! Did you fall down? Oh no! <laughs> Little baby just tripped over its own feet. <laughs> oh, but you are cute being led away by mom and accompanied probably actually by an older sister and James Bear you've asked a question that I don't know the answer to and that is what is the mortality rate of elephant calves from a year to ten years or from birth to ten years old I think it depends on the area that you're in I would say I mean elephant calf mortality in a natural environment where human beings are not a factor I would say that in a normal year, their mortality rate for young calves, once they reach a year, their survival is, unless they get sick or something else happens, it's pretty much guaranteed. Elephant herd is very, very good at looking after its own. So James, what I'm going to do is I'm going to guess at saying that probably about 85% of calves make it to 10 years old. And from there, of course, they will have a very, very strong look at this behavior. It's not me. Don't look at me like that. I didn't do anything. I've just been sitting here. What's wrong? Guys? What's there? Hmm. Don't know. It might just be the wind as well. The swirling wind, as we said before, makes them on edge. James, I don't know the answer to that. I think obviously it depends on the where you are. I, if I had to average it, I would say between 80 to 85% in a good year. The drought, I think, is going to change things tremendously. 
and I think for all and I think that will be for all newborn calves for all pregnant moms and for all calves under about two years old I think that they are really really going to struggle during the drought and I think they find that, that mortality rate will probably rise so I'm, I'm talking about an 85% survival rate so a 15% mortality rate if it's that high but they might that might actually rise maybe to 20% in terms of a mortality rate I'm really interested in this behavior every now and again they all go completely still little one trying to suckle again from a young female I'm gonna stick with these elephants for a while I'm finding their behavior fascinating and of course this calf is utterly irresistible but while we sit and watch them I believe that Steph has relocated his uh, courting pair of animals let's head across and see whether they are as enamored with each other as they were this morning These lions have just started to chase one another through the bush. I don't know if we're going to get it. There we go, there we go. Let's see if we can. So... Here we go. Look at the ass with that baleful stare. He's been doing that since this morning. Every time he stands up he looks straight at us with his eyes just daring us to come and intervene that's exactly what his body's telling him to do he owns this situation and he's standing very proud making sure that anybody or any other lion it's not anybody it's any other lion in the vicinity sees him for what he is a big magnificent dominant pride male and it's a big challenge that. It's a challenge. Come and take my female is what he's saying. And then he sits with his head up, mane bristling. Not the best view at the moment, I must be honest. These lions have moved into pretty thick bush from where they were this morning. They came off of a crest relatively open this morning. Right now. They, I've walked through this area many times. And I must be honest with you, another hundred yards or so, it becomes almost impenetrable um, where, where they are. Let's see if we can get in there. Okay, so you might have to duck as we go past this tree. All right, so just watch out here for your faces. I'll try and get in there. Lynn. You've asked me a question, it is unusual for a lion with cubs to be mating and you've hit onto the core question of today. We don't actually know if this lioness still has cubs. She definitely looks like she's got some suckle marks on her belly. Okay, big boy. It definitely looks like she's got some suckle marks on her belly and I'm hoping that she'd show, she's going to show it to us soon. But they are old suckle marks and I know that this female has been mating with first a male with a split lip and now this particular male for the last five days and it was a source of much debate this morning whether or not she still has cubs and this male's just keeping her from them or whether or not she's actually lost her cubs and is now just remating again they can come into estrus very quickly after they lose cubs And we just don't know. Only time will tell, unfortunately. At the moment, it's just guesswork. But she definitely doesn't look like she's trying to get away from him. Every now and again, she stands up and she makes a little bit of a dash. He catches her in about 50 yards or so. But you can see 
just by her posture, she doesn't look like she's a cat that is having another place to be except right here. Aline from London, you've just asked me a question about how, yeah, you've asked me to, to elaborate on something that I know very little about, is like how do male lions end up producing enough semen to carry on mating for this long? Aline, it's a glandular secretion and very similar to how your spit glands work, I'm, I'm convinced that just with enough stimulation that they would sort of endlessly produce um, enough semen. Don't forget it takes a very little bit in a drop contains hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of sperm cell, and it just takes one sperm cell to fertilize the egg. So I don't think it's in terms of volume, it's probably in terms of density of sperm per milliliter or by, by I don't quite know how much they ejaculate to be quite honest with you. Um, but you probably find that it's quite densely packed with sperm and not so much other stuff, and that allows very little ejaculate to actually come out basically but gives the greatest chance of success of fertilizing the egg when taken over a long period of time. They will mate with one another sort of every three to five minutes for the first couple of days and then it'll taper off going from five to ten minutes, ten to fifteen minutes, fifteen minutes to twenty minutes and then twenty minutes to thirty to forty and eventually when it's around about one mating every forty minutes or so then the mating is at an end. But you can imagine over a 24-hour period, over five days, that is a lot. But yeah, essentially just a glandular secretion, very similar to producing saliva, I would imagine. Haley has just asked me from England how old these male lions are. Haley, these male lions are probably around about five years old. I'm not sure exactly when they were born. Some of our viewers out there will know exactly when they were born. But they're around about five years old. They come from a couple of kilometers north of where we are right now, close to Orpen, on the other side of the Manuleti Game Reserve. They were born on a farm called Birmingham and have then moved through the Manuleti, took them a long time, took them almost a year, year and a half to move through the Manuleti, and then they came down here when they were roughly, I'm just, my memory trying to get me in here, but I think they arrived about a year ago now, and they were about three and a half years old then, so four and a half years old to five years old right now, that's how old they are. Um, definitely not in their prime just yet, you are quite right, his mane hasn't got that big black shaggy look, you can see just on the crest of his head, you'll see that fine haze of black mane starting to come through. And that's in response to his body's increase in testosterone that would started, have started to happen when they took over this area. It didn't happen overnight. They took over this area or they took over these prides in this area over a period of about a year. And it's only when they really settled that their bodies would have started to produce this extra testosterone. Their manes would start to get a little bit bigger. And I can only imagine that they'll become more and more impressive as time goes on. But you are right. Some males just never produce that big shaggy mane. Some males produce it, but because of the areas that they live in, it gets pulled out by branches and by bushes. And other, main, other males just seem to have a magnificent mane right from the word go. The males that these Birmingham boys usurped, one of him, one of him he's one of the Matimbas, had an enormous mane.
excuse me for a couple of seconds. I've just got to speak on the radio. Guide Andrew in here. So you have a look at the lines. I'm going to be on the radio. Uh, Andrew, come in for Steph. Uh, if you come uh, di um, if you come straight into the bush, basically straight into the block where Central from Cheetah Cut Line makes that first zigzag, if you come straight into the bush, straight west from there, I'm just probably about 70 or 80 meters from the road, just behind the first screen of trees. I got you audio. So folks, I'm just going to be guiding Andrew in here quickly. He can't see my vehicle tracks, which is not uh, uncommon. Um, and we're going to get him in here and then we're going to hand over the administration of the sighting to him and I'll carry on speaking to you then. So for now, please just bear with me for a second or two. We get Andrew in and then... Oh, sorry about that. The lineup is is Andrew and Taxon and myself in this particular position off of Central Road, Drakensberg Junction. Are you welcome to take first standby? I've been a, uh, no problem. Um, uh, how far away are you from this particular position? Okay, copy. I'll give you a shot in a little bit. All right, sorry about that, folks. Like I said, it's just a bit of a mating lines is not an everyday occurrence out here, and for some reason, the traffic around this particular sighting today is pretty not the heaviest it's ever been but definitely noteworthy there's a lot of people that want to come and see it so i think what we're going to do is we'll probably stay and see if we can see these cats mate one more time then we'll make some space for some others to come and have a look and then we'll drive around and we'll come back again But James, James Richard, you just asked me how far these lions have traveled between uh, this morning when we left them and now. They're probably about a kilometer, so 0.6 of a mile away, um, 750 yards or so, as the crow flies. They've just gone through two thickets, and that's what took us a little bit of time to find them this afternoon, I must be honest. Here she goes, looks like she's going to stand up. I'm going to get a chance to mate again. Let's see how far she goes before they do mate. You can see her belly there. Have a look at those suckle marks. So you can see that she's definitely, her memory glands are swollen. Look at how big he is, eh? Easily, easily outweighing her. Probably 30%. Waving her tail in his face. <laughs> teasing, teasing the whole time. And of course, they're going to disappear into the thick bush. I almost think they're almost coming to the end of all this. There, she's going to submit now. No, is it? No, she's still running away from him. There we go. And luckily, just in that tiny window of bush. Oh, sorry about that. Jamie's got something that you need to be pulled away from. Enjoy. Look at what we've got. 
This must be one of the longest sightings that we've managed to catch so far of a slender mongoose. There it goes. Isn't that incredible? We hardly ever get to see them, hence why we had to rush you away from Steph's sighting. How cool is this? It's a mongoose that we hardly ever get on camera. Dashing away, they're usually so shy. Bounce, 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 bounce. And off it goes. And that's it. That's probably the last we're going to see of that slender mongoose. But how cool was that? A slender mongoose on camera. It's one of the mongoose species. We get to see dwarf mongoose a lot. But we hardly ever get the, dwarf, uh, the slender mongoose on camera. Or to sit still long enough on camera. They're much, much more retiring than their dwarf mongoose cousins. Ah, oh, where'd you go? Where'd you go? That's, I think, it. Let me just stop and have a look. I did that once and it worked with a slender mongoose. Or at least I've done that many times and worked once with a slender mongoose. Just generic squeaking sounds, essentially. It's more like a contact call of a dwarf mongoose. I tried. It was definitely worth the effort. We have raced through to Arethusa for a surprise. I'm not telling you what it is yet, and I'm not, I don't actually know where we sit because I haven't managed to communicate yet with any of the guides but a uh, little birdie told me that it might be worth popping round to Arethusa this afternoon. So we've got special things in store. Huh. I'm just going to listen to the game drive comms. Bear with me one second. Ah, lovely. We have some inside information to thank for this little update. Bear with me a second. I'm going to just wait for this person to finish calling in. I don't want to call in though because I'm going to give away the surprise for those of you who are regular viewers and can speak our lingo. Hmm. So I'm going to actually send you back across to Steph while I call myself into the sighting and I will be back with you a little bit later hopefully with a surprise. Welcome back. You know after you just left us together that brilliant slender mongoose sighting those lions jumped up and jumped into the thickest bush possible and because I know this area has this such thick bush I made some space for some of the other rangers and some of the other guests out here who haven't seen these lions mate to come in so that they can see these lions mate before uh, they disappear into bush that no one can follow them in so definitely definitely just trying to do our neighborly bit Johnny would you mind breaking off a big branch there what I've asked Jean-Ray to do is break off a piece of this tree so that I can leave a marker on the road for the next ranger to come in here. Quickly going to do that. Are you battling there, Jean-Ray? You don't have to break the whole tree down, just the branch. Yeah, there we go. I just need to take out my... Wait, you're going to cut yourself on that side. <laughs> I'm just doing a bit of bush clearing here. Let me show you the tiny stick that was bothering Jandre. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so what I'm going to do is leave the stick in the middle of the road. And 
that should serve as a marker to the other rangers that are coming down. If they manage to come out into the open again, Come on, Wendy, don't do that to me. There we go, there's a good girl. I want to break Wendy. She's quite a special lady. All right. And to such a special sight, you know, we were so privileged to spend so much time with them this morning. And and uh, and although they've moved into some thick bush now, it just adds to the story that is the story of the Nkuhuma pride. And I honestly think that that is where the story lies, is with this pride of females that has been in this area for who knows how long. There were lots of lions here to start with in the in the in the in the park. There's historical records going back for at least a hundred years that detail how many lions were actually here. And although they were persecuted at a point, um, when people started to move into this particular valley, it was very seasonal because malaria and flooding kept people out of these valleys during the summer months. And so lions have stayed in this area for thousands, perhaps even hundred thousands of years. And it's just interesting to be in an area where family lions could run so deep you don't quite know. What we are witnessing now is just something that's happened countless times before, over countless generations. But is it in the same family? And to me, that sort of thing is pretty epic. I quite enjoy that sort of thinking. I'm just going to tell Vernon that I've left a branch on the road from him. Uh, Vernon and Taxon, I've left a weeping wattle branch uh, on the road. If you come from Chitakat line down central, just at the first zigzag, just uh, you'll see on the northern side of the road the Peltoforum branch and just head straight west from there. All right, so that is our little bit done. And believe me, where those lions were walking into now, even trusty Wendy wouldn't be able to get inside there. You need a helicopter, I think, to view those lions in, in the next half an hour. As you saw from that female, she's starting to get up and move quite, quite a distance before the, the male manages to dominate her. And although she's submitting, and she definitely doesn't look like she's scrambling away from this particular male, they are moving, and they're moving quite fast. I have no doubt that they'll probably move quite a distance before the end of uh, the end of tonight of course lions move a lot more in the evenings than they move in the daytime and we might find them clear across on the other side of Juma by the end of tonight now I have heard that there's a dead elephant in Bifosuk I don't exactly know where in Bifosuk this dead elephant is um, it seems to have died of natural causes. There's no real evidence that it's died of malnutrition or of dehydration. Um, elephants die just like everything else does. And from time to time, elephants die here. And I think that's exactly what's happened. But that is going to be a feast of feasts for everything around. I think hyena are going to be squabbling there tonight. Vultures are going to be all around there during the day. It's going to be an absolute magnet for larger predators, lions in particular. Where, if it is in Buffalo's Hook, it's probably square in the terrain of the Birmingham boys as well as the Nkuhuma pride. They enjoy Buffalo's Hook as their own. But it also might be quite close to a boundary, in which case there might be some competition there. And it's at large carcasses like that on the boundaries of pride territories that you can sometimes get the most unbelievable fights between lion prides. Strength of numbers being the key factor in lion fights. In actual fact, between not only between lion prides, but also between lions and ahina, strength of numbers is what counts. In the case of lion and ahina, they are both super predators out here. They both share that top rank, similar to how a great white shark and a killer whale 
share the top rank in the oceans. Lions and hyena share that top tier yeah, as being super predators. And it really is just dependent on how much the pack weighs. So, for instance, a lion is, let's say, 100 kilograms and a hyena is, let's say, 50 kilograms. To chase one lion away, you'd need two or more, preferably, hyenas, and they would chase away one lion. In this particular area, in the Sabi Sands, the lions far outweigh the hyenas here, and the hyenas are almost always outcompeted by by the by the lion one or two odd occasions i think we've even managed to show you a couple of occasions where lion have been seen off by hyena enough hyenas in enough numbers but in other places in africa in particular a place that i visited between the masai mara and the serengeti in tanzania there hyena outnumber lions almost 50 to 1. Lions have been persecuted there for stock theft for so many years that there's not too many lion left in those areas. And lions just literally hide away in thickets the whole day and let hyenas reign king. And they pretty much do what they want. Hyenas there kill full-grown buffalo. Walk around in the day, they do pretty much just what they feel like doing there. And are absolute in their rain. Quite a funny place. In an area like that, here South Africa has been lucky enough to fence their national parks and their private reserves away from people. And so the buffer zone between people and animals is very thin. You go from a village type environment where people can walk around at night and you know kids can play in the street to proper bush, deep in the bush, literally on the other side of a road. Whereas in other parks in Africa where there hasn't been that much money to fence parks in or to maintain fences, um, you have this buffer zone, this gray zone. It's called a game management area. And it's an area where people are not permitted to live, but are permitted to graze their cattle or to harvest medicine or wood under permit and to hunt a certain degree as well. Yeah. Nice herd of waterbuck. Distinguished by that quite prominent white marking on the rump, that is a following mechanism. Babies would zone into that marking. As you can see, that baby is behind mom now. They would zone into that white marking and follow mom away from danger by following and or locking onto that white marking. Other animals have a white blaze under their tail or in, in lion's terms a black tuft on the end of their tail. It's all just to accentuate movement of that part or to lock a vision and there to guide babies and other herd members away from danger. I think they can hear those lions. They are listening in exactly the direction that the lions are mating in. Probably about a mile or two away now from the sighting. Nevertheless, they're coming through this area. Very thick with lots of drainage lines. And I think we're slightly elevated now. I think the sound is carrying across this valley. And they're busy listening intently as to what's going on, except the baby who's now listening to us. Quite furry, and the reason for that and why they get their name, waterbuck obviously get their name because they're not scared of water. They will quite often run into water to escape predators, and they will quite often browse into water, living or able to live on water grass and water hyacinths. Their skin has a lot of sebaceous glands that secrete an oil. That oil coats their skins and repels the water. And the long fur on a waterbuck helps to draw the water and shed water from the coat. Similar to how leather thongs on a jacket helped to shed water. Nowadays they're used as a bit of decoration. But the reason why there were leather strips on jackets. Now we used to see them on motorbike jackets I think back in the early days as was to shed water to draw water off of the jacket 
and that is why waterbuck have long hair to shed water very quickly from the skin along with their oily secretions so that they dry quick oh. notice how fast those reactions are something gave that waterbuck a fright and babies disappeared one way adults another now they're just listening It's not to say there isn't a leopard or something around here. I mean, it's not uncommon for leopard to walk straight through lion sightings. I'm not discounting the fact that there's no other predator around here. Well, they're very alert. They don't seem to be able to see anything. Waterbuck, that sea danger, do give a warning bark. Not quite as impressive as a kudu or an impala, but they definitely give one. Are we ready to move on? I think so. We've now moved away into that thick bush. And let's carry on with our fur. Now, Jamie's eventually, or I think she's not eventually, I think she's been in Arethusa for quite some time, and I'm sure she wants to give you an update about what her plans are. absolutely no intention of giving you an update as to what my plans are but suffice to say I think you will be pleasantly surprised at the end of them but for now my plan is to try and get you a really nice view of this sub-adult fish eagle the same one that we were looking at yesterday afternoon on the sunset safari hey yeah, come on stay 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 Now bear with me because I may have to be on the game drive comms every now and again just to make sure that we end up in the right place at the right time. Don't go anywhere. Come on. We can do this. We can do this. Come on. Okay, just a little bit further. And off goes the engine. And the question of course on everybody's mind that is now answered or at least everybody who is watching the sunset safari is that our sub-adult fish eagle appears to have lost the loose feather that was dangling about ridiculously when we arrived here yesterday afternoon on the sunset safari. It is a fish eagle that is in the process of molting. Just listening to Game Drive comments, sorry. We're nearly there, guys. We're just waiting our turn for an awesome sighting. I'm so excited. Oh, oh, that whole that branch looks like it's about to go. That whole tree looks like it's about to break. That is one very brave fish eagle. Now, of course, it doesn't look like what we traditionally know a fish eagle to look like, and that, of course, is because it's still a young one. It has not yet acquired its adult plumage. And it is, in fact, in the process of molting, as I said, losing its feathers. Yesterday it had the most ridiculous dangling feather that was terribly clearly frustrating it, but it couldn't quite pluck out. That clearly has come loose at some point in the hours that have intervened since we last saw it. Oh, careful. You seem to be playing with fire, inching towards the edge of that branch there. One of my all-time favorite birds of prey. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> this is getting nerve-wracking. Don't inch any further, fish eagle, or you're going to find yourself with a bit of a problem on your hands. Just chatting a little bit about the birds, I'm hearing lesser striped swallows. For those of you that are keen birders, I haven't managed to catch them on camera yet, but for those of you that are keen birders, the lesser striped swallows have returned already to our side of the country. They are a migratory species. It's a, spe it's a pe species, bleh, spe species sorry, of swallow. <laughs> Goodness gracious. That sounds a little bit like R2-D2. Whoop, whoop, whoop. 
You'd have to hear them to understand exactly what it is I mean. They come and they very they return to the same nests year after year that they make underneath the thatching of lodges and human habitation. There he goes. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Well, that was embarrassing. <laughs> How terribly unfortunate. Sorry, Fishigal, I don't mean to laugh at your misfortunes. Yes, perhaps pick a more solid tree next time. That was not your best plan. Deary me. They, of course, prefer the trees without leaves, which is why they go for the dead ones. But that was an unfortunate choice, because clearly that tree was in the process of rotting. The smarula tree, that is not rotting, that has simply lost its leaves for the duration of winter, is a far more secure choice, if you are a fish eagle. Whoopsie daisy. That was... Well, it takes some years to learn the grace that they need to acquire. And as we spoke about yesterday, for some of these birds of prey, we saw a juvenile... Oh, off he goes again. We saw a juvenile batelier this morning on the oh, awesome sunrise safari we spoke about the fact that it can take some birds of prey sorry I'm just I'm just waving hello to the Simbombili vehicle at the same time <laughs> um, friends of mine um, and it can take them seven up to seven to eight years to acquire their adult plumage. And the fish eagle slightly less time, not quite the same length of time that a batelier takes, but nevertheless then this one clearly hasn't totally made it to adulthood yet, as that poor choice in perch indicated. Sorry, there's lots lots happening in my ear right now. I know that Steph has spoken about this and the fact that we've got to listen, talk and look at the animals at the same time um, and the, Steph, one of my favorite moments with Steph was when he started presenting down the Game Drive channel when I first started working at Wild Earth. There's our fish eagle. Definitely a more secure perch. I've very recently started a collection of juvenile fish eagle feathers. I say very recently because it started yesterday afternoon when I picked up one of this chap's missing feathers. Look, another one's coming loose on the top there. The one with the one of the primary flight feathers. No wonder it's so graceless. Slowly losing feathers. They are absolutely beautiful birds, and at the moment they're hanging out around Arethusa Dam because, of course, those poor catfish are stuck in a seriously small area, desperately thrashing about those that are still alive. And for these fish eagle, it is a time of plenty. It's basically the equivalent of shooting fish in a barrel, except it's just catching fish in a very small mud wallow. And that is what we saw yesterday afternoon on the Sunset Safari. Well, while I wait my turn to enter into your surprise sighting that I'm not going to tell you any more about, here's the fish eagle feather that I picked up and acquired yesterday afternoon on the Sunset Safari. Isn't it beautiful? You can really see that it belongs to the juvenile with this mottled quality to it. Oh, by the way, the grey all over my fingers, which we're not going to focus on right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've been painting the new final control, and it turns out grey paint is surprisingly, surprisingly difficult to get off one's fingernails. <laughs> yeah, no, that's stuck. We've had a great time, though. Hey, Dave. Yep. Yes, we did. It was very therapeutic. But yes, we're paint we were painting a room, hence the grey all over my cuticles and fingernails. But yes, this beautiful feather. And just have a look here. If we have a look, oh goodness, there's grey everywhere. I'm starting to get very self-conscious about it. Um, if we have a look here, this length of the feather 
is actually what sits in the bird in order to hold that feather in place because you can just imagine the amount of force that is exerted on a feather like this and it's got to be firmly rooted in order for it to stay in one position. Now I just want to check something very carefully so bear with me as I pop my feather away. I want to just know whether or not Ah, definitely, I definitely do still have comms. Just checking to make sure. Our fish eagle's gone. Mm. That's because it's behind us. Oh, now it's flying. Sorry, Dave, don't even worry. It's flying right behind you. Don't go back to that knob thorn. The oh, there's, there's another one. There's the second one. We did actually see two yesterday. This is awesome. Fish eagle haven around Arethusa Dam. This one at a slightly different stage of its plumage situation. A lot more dark. That one is actually probably younger than the one we were looking at before. That one's probably a juvenile as opposed to a subadult. And that individual also starting to lose feathers. That individual is the one that the fish eagle, the adult fish eagle, caught the catfish for yesterday afternoon on the Sunset Safari. So some amazing interaction there. And actually learning so much about the fish eagle's behavior just by sitting here and watching. And I'm sitting here very deliberately, I don't want to go anywhere else, because I'm waiting for a turn to go into a sighting that is not too far away from here. Ooh. Sorry guys, I just need to listen to this. Never mind, carry on Rebecca, don't worry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all gone anyway. <laughs> Sure. Oh, really good question from Ellen while I look for things to keep you busy while I wait for my time into the sighting. I don't really want to get out of the car because I'm worried. Okay, I'll do this quickly. So Ellen's question is, do the adult fish eagles have a territory? And will the juveniles acquire a portion of that territory when they are adult? And I just don't want to be off the vehicle for too long with my earpiece out because it's the only way I can have a game drive com. So I'll show you what I've picked up in a moment. Sorry, I've got to get that back in as quickly as possible. Ellen, I know that adult fish eagles are territorial. They often have scuffles. You'll see them especially around prime territory, around river frontage. I don't know how big their territories are. I know that a Varose eagle owl has a territory in a, in a prime area of roughly four kilometers along a river front. So a giant eagle owl. I imagine that a fish eagle has a territory length, or a fish eagle pair at least, will have a territory length of something similar. I don't think they would give a juvenile a portion of their territory in the same way, for example, our female leopards do with their female offspring. But I don't know. I'm not 100% certain on that, and I would love if any of you do have any further information. I, I suspect that the juveniles just have to go off and establish their own territory when they find a, a mate one to pair off with but I'm really not a hundred percent sure okay next in the show and tell is our giant land snail shell complete with hole that may well have been bored in by one of the insects look at that absolutely amazing I suspect something bored in there, into, like an insect, like an insect. And there we have a giant land snail shell that has bleached its way, slowly starting to lose its coloring. Can you actually see? Oh, you can. You're right. Look at that. Something pierced it. One hole on one side. Hey, that's awesome. Well spotted, Dave. Absolutely incredible. And you can also, it's really nice with this zoom to see how it started to become mottled. Going from the brown color when we see them when they're alive to the white calcified color as they start to age. Let's just see this hole on the other side. Where is it? Oh, sorry, I nearly took that away. What magic is this? I don't... 
uh, well, we're just seeing through it this way. <laughs> we're just seeing through it from the inside. I couldn't work that one out. There's the hole there. Uh huh. Dave, um, you and I were not very bright there. No, but that's okay. We can be forgiven because I'm listening with half an ear to the Game Drive channel. Um, I'm not sure what your excuse is. <laughs> we'll make up. You're focusing on the camera. Exactly. On fantastic camera work that you are doing for us right now. And there you go. A land snail shell in the sort of initial stages of its slow fading into what will eventually become a bleached, totally white shell. And I found eggs in these old abandoned land snail shell before but there's nothing in here except some dirt and a few millipede remains Ooh, here we go there you go the exoskeleton of some hapless millipede that found itself deceased in a land snail shell awesome okay what else is around us for us to talk about while we wait? Okay, we <laughs> in that case, I'm going to bounce our shell back into the dirt from whence it came so that other animals can utilize it. So while we wait for our turn at the surprise, I'm going to send you back across to Steph. Let's find out what he's up to. Hello, hello, and welcome back to what is none other than just a bumble through the bush at the moment <laughs> i don't really know i'm a bit lost for something to do at the moment i'm uh, i'm in two minds about where we go i think i am wanting to take over where jamie left off with the search for karula i haven't seen karula or her cubs in quite some time in actual fact i haven't even seen karula's cubs yet and i think that that's exactly what i want to do i want to go and trawl through the areas that um, they were searching this afternoon and see and this morning in actual fact and see if i can potentially dredge up some new piece of information or perhaps karula has decided to come out of all this thick stuff here but i think that that's what i'm going to do with the hope that i bump into her or the tree that her cubs are hiding in at the moment so jamie this afternoon thought that the elephant that were trumpeting in the thick bush around the Mawati drainage line were trumpeting at Karula because the tracks went in there but didn't come out. That's a definitely plausible, uh, definitely plausible reason to go and have a look there. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Take a slow amble down Twin Dams Road, starting at Voyatilla Dam. The pan, of course, at Voyatilla Dam being why I'm going there. It's a great attraction to vast numbers of animals, most of which Karula would see as a food source. Now for those that are just joining the show, welcome. Karula is a female leopard that lives in this particular area. She's a dominant female leopard. She's been here for a long time and is one of the stars on our show. She has two young cubs at the moment that she is keeping a little bit of the time on Juma's Traverse, or the area that we drive around in, and a little bit further south of where we can drive around in. Ah, traffic jam. <laughs> Just calling them over. We've definitely got the easier place to make a turn. Excuse us for just pointing into the bush for a little bit. Hello. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Bye. There we go. That was easily done. Overtaking maneuver here. All right, and on we go. There we go. Oh, Wendy performing okay. Touch wood for that. <laughs> we'll try and keep on paying Wendy compliments. All right, now going through these thick bush areas here in one of these drainage lines, one of my favorite things to do, quite often if you just take your time to just switch off and scan through this area, you can pick up some amazing things. So just give me a couple of seconds just to scan through this environment and see what we can see. 
may be of interest to us. And we've got a crested Franklin that is digging around in some dung there. Sorry, not a crested Franklin, a Natal Franklin. Now some of the Natal spurfowl is what they're now called. Some of the Natal spurfowl have got babies. Let's go forward a little bit. That is a male. So that's not going to be the case with him. There he is. So orange colored legs diagnostic and that downward swept tail. Crested Franklin from a distance. You can always tell the crested Franklin because their tail is swept upwards. Similar to how you see some chickens. And the tail Franklin can do that but hardly ever does. So from a distance, quick ID. Diamond swept tail, sunburnt legs, and a tail Franklin. A friend of mine, when I was busy learning my birds, once told me that to remember the Natal Franklin and the red legs, Natal is a province, KwaZulu Natal is one of the provinces in South Africa, and a fantastic beachgoers leisure spot, and people that come quite often are prone to sunburn. And he said the easiest way to remember the Natal Franklin is when you look at their legs, they'll be red like they've been sunburnt. And that's the Natal Franklin, rather than the yellowy legs of the crested Franklin. I've never really worked that well, I'll be quite honest with you. For me, the easiest was just to look at the tail. <laughs> All right, now we're coming out onto Gauri Main, close to Voyatella. And you'll start seeing that the landscape becomes very sparse. And that's simply as a result of there being permanent water here. And animals are drawn to and from this water. And of course, animals being animals and not wanting to expend any unnecessary energy. We're always feeding close to the dam. And they would, as the dry season becomes more pronounced, their feeding expeditions would get further to the dam for water, further to the dam for water, further to the dam for water, further. And so the most Basically, the destruction, if you can call it that, is always close to the dams that we're seeing here. And you can clearly pick out the undesirable plants from the desirable ones. All right. Talking about undesirables. There is a thicket of monkey orange here, something that I don't find desirable whatsoever. Right, let's take a look at this pan that we've got here. A lot of you will be very familiar with this particular pan, having seen it for years and years and years on the dam camera that we have stationed here. Often a very big help to us in sourcing animals and finding them. But Bud, all the way from North Carolina, good afternoon, Bud. You've asked if there are any animals that have been reintroduced to the Sabi Sands and Juma uh, from captivity or from other places or countries where they occur but didn't occur here. Um, yes, I'm going to say that white rhino is probably, white and black rhino in actual fact, but white rhino is probably the most significant reintroduction story. Um, there were no white rhino left in the Kruger National Park in the middle to late 90s. And then a, a brilliant gentleman by the a doctor called Ian Player introduced white rhino from the Tlhuhi Umfalosi National Park. And from there sprung all the white rhino and I think the black rhino were introduced from Namibia. I, I'm not too sure about the black rhino. I, I stand corrected there. But the white rhino from the Tlhuhi Umfalosi National Park and today's 
I don't know how many thousand odd rhino that we have in the Kruger National Park. Estimates vary from 20,000 to less than 10,000. Um, rhino in the park all stem from those first few reintroductions. In the Sabi Sands, most notably were, was uh, or are the Nyala. Um, although Nyala did occur naturally in this area, their numbers were so low that they were reintroduced into this area, funnily enough, onto Juma. Um, I think it was in the 1990s where a couple of pairs were also received from Lithuium Filosi and reintroduced very successfully into the Sabi Sands, whereas today it's one of the most common of the antelope species that we find. Um, we have had several reintroductions of ostrich into the Kruger National Park, or oh, not into the Kruger National Park, uh, uh, into the Sabi Sands of ostrich and brindled gnu or blue wildebeest. We've also had a few reintroductions. Also, from the, the wildebeest came from Swaziland. I'm not too sure where the ostriches came from. Um, wildebeest numbers, while stable in the Sabi Sands, they don't tend to stay here very long. There's much better quality grassland that lie adjacent to the Sabi Sands, and as soon as the wildebeest recognize that they can just walk to where the grass is greener, they do so. They are migratory, um, so there's nothing that will really keep a wildebeest. And the ostrich reintroductions have almost entirely failed. Um, the ostriches that have been introduced into the Sabi Sands have become lion feather dusters very soon after they were reintroduced. We do see a couple of wild ostrich on cheetah plains on those vast open areas. There are a couple of ostrich there. Whether or not those were wild ostrich that have just uh, moved onto those plains or whether they were part of the original reintroductions, I, I don't know. I don't know enough about those reintroductions. But yeah, that's a nice question there, uh, bud. You've, um, first time I've ever been asked that question. Can you believe it? In a couple of thousand game drives that I've taken in my life. Right, this is where they last had Karula in this stretch of bush. She loves this particular stretch of bush. Her cubs have loved this particular stretch of bush. She very often roams between three dams, Vuyatela, Twin Dams, which we will make a turn past now, and Treehouse. And that is exactly what we're going to do now, is we're going to visit all three dams, get to one, switch off, get to another, switch off, and listen to the bush around us, see if we can't manage to track her down. As I said, I haven't seen her cubs yet, and I'm, I'm sorely wanting to. Cindy has just re asked the question, is it normal for Karula to move the cubs? Wouldn't she just leave them in one place? Cindy, you, you write on, you write and, 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 um, I'm not wrong, but you, you, you write and you're not so right. Um, she will move her cubs from time to time so that the cubs don't build up any sort of uh, smell signature in the area or predators don't become aware of her cubs. So she'll keep the cubs on the move and that's just to keep them out of harm's way. She will also stash her cubs throughout the day um, and for a couple of days while she goes hunting. So she will move the cubs every, every so often, every couple of days from safe haven to safe haven. And then she'll also leave her cubs at that place to forage for food, coming back to the cubs with either food in her mouth or in her belly in the form of milk. And then at times, when they're a little bit older than they are now, she will take her cubs to cached food. The leopard cache their food underneath bushes and also in the tops of trees. Karula herself likes to store kills in the tops of trees and has brought her cubs, I think even these cubs she's actually brought to certain kills in trees. So you write in two instances there. She does both, in other words, not one or the other. We flash through the bushes there, indicated a brown hooded kingfisher. Uh, I doubt we're going to see these very active little birds. They live in these thickets that you're looking at now. 
and fly from perch to perch inside these thickets, basically waiting to catch near anything that they can, even mice, snakes, etc. that are quite difficult to get on camera actually. Living in these thick bushes doesn't afford us the luxury of being able to track them and zoom in. This is very typical leopard country that you're having a look at now. And there's a very typical leopard food. Now, I'm going to get the camera ready first because we tend to battle to get these guys. They run away, as their namesake suggests. And as soon as we come into view, this is going to disappear. <laughs> exactly. That is a daker, a grey daker, a dwarf antelope that's full grown, as you can see. Supremely camouflaged. Just browsing leaves there. Characteristic. And Barry Miller, who's a brand new viewer. Welcome, Barry. Barry. Welcome to the site, welcome to the product. You've asked me, do the antelope that we have here lose their horns, similar to deer? Um, Barry, no. Simply because it doesn't get cold enough for animals to need to lose their horns. In winter time, today's been a pretty cold day and we've sat at about 60 degrees Fahrenheit throughout the day. Not cold enough that the extremities of a horn chill the body or chill or have the ability to call, to chill the core temperature down so animals tend to keep their horns here make their horns stronger by giving them a bony core and turn them into defensive weapons for the variety of predators that we have here as well so no they don't lose their horns quite simply because they didn't need to from an environmental point of view and their horns have then changed over time to become weapons as well as display pieces whereas the deer and I'm gathering in the northern hemisphere somewhere whose horns are generally used for display during the mating season don't always have a primary defense role as horns here would have and I'm thinking in my mind of an elk or a moose which have these fantastic spreads of horns used to wrestle with one another and fight off opponents but are shed in winter time because to supply blood and food to this massive spread of horns in the middle of winter when that blood comes from that extremity back into the horn it would have the ability of chilling that animal down too much right so that was that was Leopard Food 101 with a little grey daker in primary leopard country here, or prime leopard country. We are making our way now to Twin Dams, another very lucky place for us to find tracks and signs of Karula, a female leopard that lives in this particular area that we're looking for. Don't forget that if you are a new viewer, you can always ask us a question or even make a comment based on what we're looking at at the moment, even if you think it's particularly nice or not so nice. You can send that via email to questions at wildearth.tv or you can use a Twitter handle called the hashtag Safari Live and we'll try and get through as many of them as we can during a drive. We do this twice a day, three hours at a time, every day. You can come on what I believe to be the world's largest safari vehicle as a phrase coined by a dear friend Hayden Turner. And something that very, very aptly describes what we do here. Now generally I'm just scanning through the bush over here to pick up any sort of anomalies that I can see. And by an anomaly, I'm usually with certain trees 
look like and what they're supposed to look like. My eye catches on something that doesn't look normal. Let me give you an example of what that is like. So immediately on this tree and genre is zoned into it equally as fast. That blaze that you see there on the tree, it's something that's not normal and would require obviously us to sit. Now I knew from a little bit of a distance away that that was where an elephant, an elephant's tusk has pried off a piece of that bark. Obviously couldn't get enough purchase on the side of this tree to do any real damage to it. Luckily, that tree is a gorgeous specimen of a buffalo thorn. Now for those of you who have been following the show for a while, you'll realize that buffalo thorns generally are just these tiny little bushes, maybe two or three yards across and up to maybe, you know, maybe a yard or two high. But right here, we've got a tree buffalo thorn, one of the very few that the elephant haven't managed to absolutely annihilate. So yes, that's what we look for, is these anomalies, and that caught my eye and Jandro's eye, tells a little bit of a story, and so we carry on. So I'm looking for these anomalies in the bush, and while I'm busy speaking to you, as I'm seeing them, I'm trying to categorize what it is and see what it is, diagnose what it is. And I'm hoping that at some point, my eye catches a leopard lying in a tree or walking on the road somewhere. James Richard, you have asked me a question about what would be uh, the minimum amount of rain needed to make a dramatic change to the bush here. Uh, James, because this is our dry season, but it is also our dormant season, it is our winter here, it's not really about rainfall, but it's also got to do with the amount and the intensity of sunlight that's available right now. And so a couple of things would need to happen, not just uh, giving us a significant amount of rainfall. If we all of a sudden got 100 millimeters of rain that fell tonight, it won't have a massively accelerating effect on the greening up. We'd have to go, go into a portion of the year in conjunction with the rain that has a more intense and longer sunlight duration through the day. And that'll start happening literally in the next three weeks or so. The days will start to get longer than they were a couple of weeks back. The amount of sunlight available and the intensity of sunlight will increase every single day. And although the rains will only really start coming around October and into November, we will start to see the seasons change already from about the middle of next month. I'm predicting us to see the first flowers of the season, the knob thorns, tree wisterias, weeping boar beans, shambok pods, uh, and mopani pomegranates basically starting to come into flower as early as, let's put a date to it. I'm gonna go the 10th, why not? The 10th of August, but somewhere between the 10th and the 20th of August, I predict us to see our first flowers of the season. So now we are at Twin Dams and I am going to switch off here. And see on not just see but listen to the bush around us to see if we can hear anything, particularly alarm calls of something. But on a day like today, where it's been quite cold the whole day, it's not uncommon for leopard to even call in the middle of the day. We're under this beautiful jackalberry tree. One of the forest giants here, growing up to 25 meters, which is probably around about 26 or 27 yards into the air.
scanning as much as my ears as I am with my eyes. Arguably, I'd say that my ears are probably, apart from being my most visible asset, they're also the tool on my head that I use the most when finding animals. Use the most when finding animals. can see those bare patches of sand between the bushes. Lots of those evergreen trees you're looking at there are the common spike thorn. A tree with incredibly high tannin levels in its leaves. So just taking the time to listen to the bush around us. I remember quite a fond story of this tree we're sitting next to. I was here visiting Scott in May last, April last year. It was just before we started to trial the walks that are now commonplace on our safaris. And we parked our car in exactly this position underneath this tree and exactly where you're looking, that horizontal branch in the middle of the screen. There was a leopard lying on that branch. We didn't even see it. And a tree squirrel was busy calling from a nearby bush. And next thing, this leopard dived off of this tree, ran down this trunk, jumped over there where you're seeing onto the ground and walked past us. And we managed to follow that particular leopard. We managed to follow that leopard from this point all the way out on Triple M boundary, which is probably, I don't know, six kilometers, six, four and a half, five miles away from where we are right now, through the bush. He just walked in a straight line, straight out of here, from this particular tree. It's a nice memory. That happened in April last year. All right, I can't hear anything from where we are now, so I think let's carry on going. Let's go to Tree House. But I'm going to use Gary Main. There's another anomaly. You can see on top of the the wall there. That caught my eye. Now that is quite obviously an elephant has broken a tree that was sticking out over the dam wall and uh, has made this funny teepee shape. further inspection, this ended up being an elephant kill. There's the tree there. Now upon closer inspection we can see that it's actually a knob thorn, a baby knob thorn that has been pulverized by an elephant, snapped and debranched. They eat a lot of knobthorn bark this time of the year. James, Duncan has just asked me if um, the, the roots of the bark have the most nutrients for the animals right now. Definitely the roots, uh, James. The roots absolutely have more nutrients in it than the bark. But compared to the outlying branches and compared to the leaves, the bark is more accessible and it is easier to get to. And, and although it doesn't have as much as the roots, are definitely better than eating sticks. So this elephant we got in front of us now, relatively far away, and also off of our traverse, we won't be able to go into there. And you can see tails swishing. And you are looking directly south from where we are right now. The rest of the Sabi Sands lies in that direction. We are in the northern part of the Sabi Sands. The rest of the Sabi Sands lies in the direction that that elephant is walking in. And probably from here, 
about 40 kilometers away is the southern boundary of the Sabi Sands on the, Sa on the Sabi River. The Sabi River forms the southern boundary of the Sabi Sands and was an instrumental in the formation of the Kruger National Park because the Kruger National Park's former boundary, when it was first proclaimed 100 and odd years ago as the Sabi River Conservancy, was between the Sabi River and the Willi I think the Crocodile River in the south and was a massive piece of land. Nothing like its form, its, its, its glory today is, but definitely in its time, a landmark national park named after a former president of South Africa, Paul Kruger, who was a visionary in many, in many senses as he envisioned that without protecting animals, the, and, and this was hundreds of years ago, not hundreds of years ago, 150 years ago, whatever it is, um, he said that we can't keep on utilizing and over-utilizing the natural resources that we have and we're going to have to protect them somehow. Otherwise, our children and our children's children won't be able to enjoy the quiet, wild places filled with wild animals that we have today. And today, his vision is the Kruger National Park in its current state. And you are able to share in that vision through this medium. And I think that that's quite profound. I quite enjoy that type of thing. Lots and lots of elephant that doing that herd. It looks like just judging from the tracks. Yeah, let me show you what I mean. Just judging from the tracks that have come down this road. It looks like we just caught the tail end of that particular herd. That there is all elephant tracks. All walking down the road towards us. The tracks are coming towards us. A large elephant herd. By large here, I mean probably consisting of about 12 to 24 individuals. I don't think there's not that many footprints here. It make me think that it was a conglomeration of elef elephant. The largest elephant herd that I've seen in, the, in this part of the park has been just over 100 animals, and that was big. Previously, the largest herd that I'd seen was about 70 animals together. That was in about 2001, 2002, somewhere around there. And generally speaking, they're between sort of 6 and 12 individuals, sometimes going up to about 20 for a big herd, 20, 30 is a fairly sizable herd here, noticeable in actual fact. But I have heard reports, sorry about that, that little shake that we got going there is just the road condition. I have heard reports of elephant conglomerations reaching a thousand animals, and I have seen on the Chobe River in northern Botswana, if I were to guess at how many elephants I saw standing on the banks of that river, I don't know, 20,000 maybe, 20,000 elephant, all at the same, exactly the same place at exactly the same time, just standing like many ants, basically. Quite a weird place, the Chobe National Park. The whole reserve is, is very dry in the dry season. And all the elephants in the park, it's 1.1 million hectares, I think, and they've got about 100,000 elephants in the park. To give an example, in the Kruger National Park, it's 3.5 million hectares, and we have around about 20,000 elephants. Can you imagine how many elephants is there? All these elephants congregate on the Chobe River during the dry season, not all 100,000, but very close to it. You can go and see it by boat and by car. Very impressive. All right, so Jamie has got an update for you. And while we carry on our search for Karula in this forest that we're surrounded by, um, Jamie would like to give you an update. We have the most amazing sighting for you. First of all, look at this incredible hyena with its milky blind right eye. Absolutely incredible and it's glancing up because we have found ourselves in a position with two incredible leopards. It's only my second time seeing them. 
and our picture is very very unstable so I can't change the position that we're in. This is Saleeshe and it is an incredible honor to introduce her to lots and lots of you. She's only been seen I think once on our live safaris. Saleeshe sleeping off a very full belly and up in the branches of the tree above her head is her cub Tiani. Uh, I don't think Tiani has ever been seen before on these live safaris. Unfortunately, it's very, very tricky to get a view of her. I'm compulsively pressing the brake because I'm scared the car's going to move too much and we're going to lose it. <laughs> we're going to lose picture. But we're just going to stick around here. I'm really, really hoping that we can keep this visual for you because this is her, I think she's now 14 month old female cub. We suspect the offspring of the Anderson male. Oh, it's just so incredible. I'm so, so glad that the picture came back for you so that you were able to enjoy this scene. I know that the view of this particular leopard up in the branches isn't fantastic. Take my word for it that she is absolutely incredibly beautiful. It looks like she's eating a steambok. I can't be a hundred percent sure. It is... Hello! Just saying hello to the other vehicle coming into the sighting. It looks like she's eating a steambok and then her mom resting on that side of the, on the bottom of the tree. Sorry guys, I'm distracted because one of the other vehicle needs to come around us. And I just need to speak to him. Okay, he's found his way around. So, it's my second time seeing Saleeshe, and my first time seeing her face properly. And I think for most of you, this will have come as quite the surprise. What's interesting about this sighting is that Saleeshe is pushing further and further into Shadow's territory. We are on the western boundary of Arethusa, and that perhaps, or this perhaps, is one of the reasons why we're seeing Shadow. Oh, look at that. Giving us a view of her face for the first time. Oh, such an exhausted cat. And resting her head back down again. It's exhausting business, digesting. And I'm really hoping there are lots and lots of people that are waiting to enjoy the sighting. I'm really hoping that Tiani, her cub, and the name, by the way, means the brave one, or brave one. I'm hoping that Tiani does give us a slightly better view. I have seen her before. One point she looked as when I went, I went on a game drive with some friends of mine. And it looked as though when I last saw her, she was about to pounce on a hyena. She wasn't, of course. She was just incredibly frustrated by the presence of the hyena having stolen her kill. Uh, Brian, while we look at our leopard cub up in the tree, you're wondering what age it is that they can first climb the trees. And the answer is probably around between six to eight weeks that they start clambering up. But they probably can climb even earlier than that, just not with much grace or security but at around six to eight weeks old which is why we start to view them at two months of age when they are competent tree climbers we start to watch them so that we know that they can get up out of the reach of predators such as the hyena now at 14 months of age apparently Salahesh's cub Tiani they're already showing signs of independence the story can hear a pearl spotted owl somewhere. The story goes that she caught, or at least she killed, an impala at nine months of age. That's an incredibly impressive tale. It's not a pearl spotted owlet either, it's a drongo by the way, imitating a pearl spotted owlet, the whistling that we're hearing. But yes, she is rumoured to be an incredible leopard cub. I haven't of course spent much time with her, but the, my friends who have spent 
well, they've watched her grow up, they've watched her the entire duration of her life. Apparently she is truly an amazing leopard cub. And I'm really hoping that with the slight shift, ever so slight shift in territory, that's pushed Salaheshe and Tiani further away from Elephant Plains and Shirley's and a bit more into Arethusa. I'm hoping that we might get to see more of her, particularly as she starts to get to the point that she is independent from Salaheshe, which will be in the next few months, and perhaps she will establish herself a territory somewhere where we can watch her and get to know her. I know you can't see her face, you'll have to take, your wor take my word from it that she seems to have inherited her mother's eyes from when I, look I saw her when it was dark for the first time but she looked as though she's got that sort of deep blue glint to them and tucking into that kill with absolute relish really truly enjoying it I hope you like my surprise it's certainly been an interesting experience getting here and we do find ourselves at a very interesting angle. But the added bonus, of course, is that hyena that we've been watching. And what an incredible looking individual that hyena is. With its milky eye. Beautiful hyena. Really beautiful. Dark in color. A deep, almost rich red fur. Isn't it beautiful? Now, lots of people, of course, revile the spotted hyena. They have such incredibly poor reputations. An amazing, fierce intelligence behind those brown eyes. Waiting its turn patiently for the potential of any scraps falling to the ground. And we have to give... Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> It's a piece of fur and skin. Oh, not very appetizing. But a hyena, not one to scoff at the scraps, has decided to vacuum that up. Performing a valuable cleaning service in the bush. Guys, unfortunately it's taken us, we've actually been in the sighting for quite a while. It's just taken a long time for us to find a spot where we have picture. Which means that unfortunately we actually can't stay for too much longer. So we're going to keep watching for a little bit longer and then we're going to have to pull out. Oh, Tiani's looking right at me, but I can't change my angle without, without moving and losing our picture. She's licking her paws though, so she may well come down. Let's just give it a few more minutes. Just a few. Come on, girl. Come down and show us what you look like. Resting on narrow branches. It's a very tricky tree that they've managed to hoist this kill into. But what that means is that it's protected from any birds of prey that might be looking to scavenge. I think it actually might be an Inyala, judging by the white fur, the white stripes on the fur. I think it might have been an Inyala kill. So she's licking her paws, cleaning away the residue of the kill, and I'm hoping that might mean she's going to come down. Come on, girl. Come on. There we go, there we go, there we go, there we go. Here she comes. Here she comes. Making her way down. And Fiona, even two against one, ooh, ooh, even two against one, no, the leopard will not attack the hyena. They very, very seldom do. Even a big male leopard, of which Tiani is not yet. Oh, she's never going to be a male, but she's not yet big enough to attack. Uh, leopards generally don't risk 
attacking a predator that is much, much heavier than them. Oh, here she comes. Going to greet mom. Yes. Ah, oh, this was worth waiting for. Oh, look at her. Giving mom a gentle clean. Ah, oh, this is so wonderful. Mm. A station on standby for Salesha and Bantuan for Jamie. So what's your position? Okay, copy, make your way. Um, let me know when you're at the two track in and I'll pull out for you. a few more moments with them. We've still got a bit of time. Look at her picking the ticks off mom's neck. Oh, mother and daughter portrait. This is absolutely stunning. This is the kind of, uh, everybody loves seeing new leopards and our familiar leopard characters. Oh, she's a big girl. She's a very big girl. Just over a year old. There's that view of her face. Giving herself a good grooming session. Oh, guys, I'm really sorry. Oh, awesome. Well done, Dave. Giving us a really good view of Tiani's face. Guys, I am really sorry. I know you are sending through questions. The, As you can imagine, I'm in the middle. I'm in the bottom of a river system. So I can't actually hear your questions. But what we'll do is when I... Oh, <laughs> have you got some fur in your mouth by any chance, girl? What we'll do is when I get out of this then I will be able to hear your questions a little bit better and I will be able to answer them. But for now, unfortunately, I can't hear Rebecca, so I know Terry Steele that you've asked a question and I'm sorry, I can't quite hear exactly what it is. But I promise I will answer when I've got slightly better communication. Leopards are actually a little bit more fastidious than lions in terms of their cleanliness. They're still creatures that are filled with parasites and bacteria, but they do a good job of cleaning themselves off after feeding. And we've got two almost identical images here, mother and daughter. So, so glad that we did get to share this with you. I was so worried we wouldn't have signal. And my foot that's on the brake is now starting to shake. So I'm just going to take it off. Please don't let us lose signal. Okay, we seem to be okay. Phew. That was worrying. Using those that barbed tongue to rake deep into the fur to clean away whatever she can. Very, very important that she doesn't get a buildup of any dead material, flesh or dirt in those cloth sheaths that could risk jamming up the claw itself or bluntening the claw, which of course is such a crucial part of a leopard's arsenal. Snoozing leopard. There we go, another view of her face. <laughs> she, she keeps she keeps hiding away every time we go to have a look at her.
just goes to show, you never know where your live safari is going to take you. Certainly nobody expected when we set off this afternoon that we would be enjoying time spent with Saleh and her cub. But what an incredible sighting it has been. And it just goes to show the sort of truce that a predators have reached in a, in a large way. The fact that the leopards are content to sleep so peacefully and soundly with a hyena just below them on the below them on the sand. There's the hyena there. There we go. So you can just get an idea of the distance between the three of them. And you can actually get an idea of the comparison of size. Look at the size of the hyena's body and then have a look at the leopards. Hyenas are heavier, they're bulkier, they've got stronger jaws. It's not worth a leopard involving themselves in a fight. Neither of them want, neither species want to risk injury and at this point there's no point to it. The killer's up in the tree, the hyena's waiting for scraps and the leopards know that for now their kill is safe. An awesome image from the African bush, accompanied to the soundtrack of forktail drongos serenading us all. Okay, guys, I've got to go. The unfortunate thing is that it's time for us to leave. One last look at the beautiful face of Tiani and her mother Saleeshe, and then it is time for us to leave. Uh, while we extricate ourselves from the tricky position that we're in, one last goodbye. We're going to send you back across to Steph. I do hope you have enjoyed these two incredible cats. How extremely privileged were you to have that sighting? I'm very envious of you, Salahesh and Cub sharing from what I can hear in my ear quite an amazing moment with you there so nice what a brilliant day the cats once again raining out of the skies long may that be the case here over the next couple of days I must say reminisce over the last five or so days with you and how difficult it was to pull these animals out and how things can change literally between game drives very very nice are we still looking for Karula? Myself and John Ray have seen some fresh tracks heading in this particular direction. I think it was from when she crossed in yet or last night at some point though. And where the other rangers have picked up or the other guides picked up her tracks heading down towards the Mawati from this morning. I definitely think the fresher tracks were where Aubrey and Jamie were tracking earlier today. So I'm going to head back down there. Nothing else coming out, basically, onto Gary Main. And I think for that reason that Karula is probably still on our traverse and probably still close to the Mawati. Although, to be honest with you, that leopard can walk during the day. She reminds me of a female that used to be at Sabi Sabi when I started there. And um, that female also used to just walk everywhere during the middle of the day you find her one side of the reserve in the morning by that afternoon safari rain wind sunshine heat cold whatever she's walked across the reserve so with this very gray light that we got at the moment and it being starting to get dark much quicker because of the overcast nature i've pulled out my spotlight a little bit earlier tonight Let's see how heavy the clouds are sitting that's as a result of this cold front that's came o that has come over not much difference in the temperature now compared to this morning it's still hovering in the 60s it was 60 degrees on the dot this morning when we woke up and it was 66 degrees Fahrenheit uh, when we came on safari in degrees Celsius 13 and I think 16 degrees Celsius 
here, freezing, if you're working from Fahrenheit to water or to, uh, to Celsius, freezing, where the point at which water freezes is at zero degrees Celsius, and we were at 13 this morning to give you an idea of how chilly it is. Not cold enough for me to consider putting long pants on though. So I still have shorts on. My theory being that if a chicken can stay warm with lots of feathers on the top body and not need too much on the legs, then my skinny legs are around about the same. <laughs> Not much to get cold on them. <laughs> so I'm using my spotlight now to see if I can spot any eyes with this grey light and it getting dark. It's getting so difficult to pick out those differences in texture and colour. And so now what I'm hoping for is the flash from the tapetum, which is a layer of light reflective crystals that lie in a membrane on the back of the eye socket and help, in the case of predators, to reflect the light that has missed the optic nerve back into the eyeball and to bounce around in there so that with the same amount of light a better quality picture can be generated. You can see it if you take a photograph of your dog or your cat with a flash on, you will see that their eyes glow green. That is the tapetum that is present in their particular eyes. We don't have a tapetum, and so when you take a flash from a, not a modern day camera that has that double flash that gets rid of that, but when an older camera flash, uh, and you flashed in our eyes, it was just red, and that was the red of the back of the eyeball, the, the blood in the back of the eyeball, just being magnified by the lens in our eye, and that is what we're seeing over there in the flash, the red flash in some of the earlier photographs. And so what I'm hoping for is a tapetum flash here. As <laughs> Rebecca says, she's hoping for the tapetum flash of a bush baby. We can maybe help you with that. We can go to a place where Chad showed me that a bush baby has been milking the sap from an acacia and we can actually go there now and see if we can see a bush baby. We tried last night to see that bush baby. We got him jumping through the bushes, but he was so scared of us on our approach, he jumped away before we could get a camera onto it. But we'll go there now. Let's see if we can go get it. I'm expecting that this cloud cover probably blows over Probably by the end of tomorrow, it's going to be clear skies. The temperature then will be much colder than it is now as more of the Earth's temperature will be able to escape off in the form of radiation. Currently, it's bouncing on the, what little there is is bouncing on the underneath of the clouds, keeping the temperature relatively warm. But as soon as the clouds move on and it, the skies open up, it is going to get cold again. Uh, we are Brock has asked if the start of safari times differ winter to summer. Hello Brock firstly. Secondly, yes. Um, the uh, the times do differ. We change by I think it's about an hour and a half as on there. We go say in the morning where we start now at six thirty, I think our earliest starting time is 5.30, 5.30 in the mornings, driving, and in the afternoons, where now we're going out at 3, we leave, I think at the latest, 4.30 in the afternoon, which is significant in the afternoon, so between an hour and an hour and a half, making up for the slightly longer days. The further south you go, or the further north you go, depending on which hemisphere you're in, the length of well, the time difference between day and night becomes that much more apparent. For those of you who are wanting to know what a tapetum flash looks like, let's show you. Now, to get that right, I'm going to have to put the put the you just directly behind the. Jandre, you're going to have to let me know if you can see that. 
So let me try and get the lens. There you go. That's a tapetum flash. Now that is our spotlight reflecting from the layer of crystals at the back of that impala's eye back through the lens and at us. And that is what I'm looking for. That is a tapetum flash. Ooh, the last few weeks of the dry, well not the dry season, but the last few weeks of winter are coming to an end and it's actually quite sad to be quite honest. I'm not a big fan of the dry season, unlike our friend Brent, he loves the dry season. He loves it for the simple fact is that predators are abound around the water holes. It's easy to drive through the bush. It's good to see hunts and chases and it's a prime time for lots of high action from a lot of the predators around here. But I must be honest with you, even though I don't enjoy the dry season that much, it is a bit sad to come to the end of the dry season. And the reason being is it's just, I don't know, it's just quite peaceful. Everything's dormant here and the, everything seems to be at rest and at peace. And although it's a bit dry and animals are a little bit thirsty and right now because of the drought they look a bit hungry. Some more impala going up to quarantine. You can see them running up the road. Lots of impala. going up to quarantine for the evening. It's amazing. I'm finding them walking from further and further away to get to quarantine every single night. And that's because their safe place is quarantine, but their, food, their feeding areas are getting further and further away. And I'm noticing that they're getting to quarantine almost when it's fully dark now, rather than before when they weren't walking from so far away. They're spending the majority of the daylight hours feeding in the thickets. Now, probably about a mile away from quarantine. And so they've got a mile walk back in the dark. I'll tell you what I don't want to be, is I don't want to be that impala. This is the impala in the front. That is one very brave animal. <laughs> and for that reason, I'm not going to shine on her too much. I don't want to give her any more of a problem. I also don't want to be the impala at the back. All right, now we're, we're going to go find a bush baby. And while we do so, I'm going to link back to Jamie, who's, I think, back in a good signal area. Yay, we are back in good signal area, on the move to follow up on a lion that I can hear roaring towards, back at, towards Juma. And I'm still riding the high of that incredible sighting with Salayeshe and Tiani. I'm also riding the high that we were able to get picture because it was looking very, very grim for a moment there. We were sitting there with poor Rebecca telling us we've got no picture and I'm going, but I've got two leopards and a hyena. Just terrifying. But we got it in the end. And there we go. Finally, Terry, I can hear your question clearly. Now, you're wondering if at 14 months the cubs will assist mom with the killing process or with, catch with catching and killing their prey. They can. It doesn't often happen that way. Usually mom hunts on her own and at 14 months it's often the young cub will hunt on her own as well. However, less frequently than cheetah but similar in a similar way, occasionally female leopards do bring back live prey to teach their offspring to kill and Salayeshe with um, Tiani being a, and I'm guessing at 14 months I'm not a hundred percent sure if that is her exact age I'm guessing at about 14 months she's just been named in the last month in the last two months or so but um, she, she may well still be bringing back live prey every now and again but she she might be finding that Tiani's wandering further and further afield from her and starting to gain independence. As you know, leopard cubs 
female leopard cubs at around 18 months or just between 18 months and two years become relatively independent. Uh, Tiani's probably already making kills of her own. But yes, every now and again the cub will assist, but it's they're not they're not social hunters. So they don't really hunt together in the way that lions do or even cheetah coalitions will. And I, I don't think leopards really truly know how to hunt cooperatively. Now Deborah, it's a question that I often ask myself which is whether Saleheshe is related to Karula at all. Now I've spoken before, in fact I discussed this this morning about the fact that a lot of female leopards in an area because of the way that their dispersal works because the females often give their female offspring a portion of their territory it usually means that the leopards in an area are related, the female leopards in an area are related in some way now I'm not a hundred percent sure what the connection is with Saleheshe and if any of our viewers do have information on that you can send that through. I will say that Saleheshe looks completely different to Karula. She is, oh there's somebody behind me in desperate need to get past. Let's just go and find a nice spot to pull over. Bear with me in a, for a second. Um, so Saleheshe is bigger, much much bigger than Karula. She's bigger, she's stockier, she's taller and she's longer. So she's not a direct, rel um, we know that she's not a direct relative of Karula. She's not a sister or anything like that. You might find that she's a half cousin somewhere down the line. I don't think you can get half cousins. Sorry everybody, let's just let this vehicle come decide which way they're going and to come past. Oh goodness, we've got vehicles on every side. We're trapped, Dave. It's an attack from both angles. Let's wave to one. Hi. Let's wave to the other. <laughs> no problem. They do have a really long way to go home. That was one of the Encoral vehicles. Right, let's try that again. Now, if you do have any further information on the level of relatedness between Saleheshe and Karula, you are more than welcome to send that through to us. As, of course, for new viewers with any new questions on hashtag, not new questions, any questions, on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through on questions at wildearth.tv and please feel free to send us through that info. Why do I feel like they were about to bump into a sighting here? Oh no, we just passed, just, just cars on their way home. Let's not blind them. The wild earth vehicles are lit up like Christmas trees. You can see us coming a mile away. Good, thanks. How are you? Good, good, good. Sorry, my lights got stuck. No, it's <laughs> I think I heard that they said there's singala colouring around Weaver's Nest. Maybe if you want to go shoot up there, coming south. Eh? Awesome. Yeah, I just heard them now, so I'm going to go investigate on our way home. Mm, go take a look. Okay. You got to on your own Somewhere, yes. But I went to go look for them now. They were in love everywhere. Yeah, yeah. same as this side. She's plenty. Yeah, lots and lots of them. Plenty, yeah. Cool. Excellent. All right. Thanks very much. Yeah, Cheers, guys. That was Cedric, by the way, from Arethusa. Let's go find these lions quickly for the end of the sunset safari. Wonder where they've been hiding and where they got, where they popped out from. What were we talking about? Oh yes, we were talking about um, Saleheshe and her connection to Karula. Definitely not a direct relative, but really lovely to see a leopard that we hardly, hardly ever get to see. Well, I race across to where I heard the lions. Fingers crossed we find them before the end of the sunset safari. I'm going to hand you back over to Steph, the very capable hands of Steph, 
and he can say goodbye to you all. Okay, we've managed to find your bush baby, Rebecca. And for everyone else, I've just got the tapetum flash. I'm trying to show it to you. It's here on the left hand side. Now, uh, yesterday when I was here, this bush baby sprang away at full speed. Let's see what he does now. I'll try to keep my options open here. So he was in this tree right here. Let's see if we can sneak up on this guy. Where are you, little dude? Yesterday he did exactly the same thing. As soon as we arrived, he jumped away. Let's see what we can get out of the bush here for you. He seems to be quite shy, I'll be honest with you. No, sorry about that. So rather than me making, rather than me making excuses about this bush baby not being here, I'll just say that we didn't see a bush baby. It was a figment <laughs> of my imagination. I take full responsibility for that, and we'll keep on looking. Okay, now for the last couple of minutes and seconds left of this drive, I just want to take the opportunity to say thank you very much for joining us today. We've had a cracker of an afternoon. Uh, lions, elephant, leopard, mating lions, leopard with babies. It's been a real pleasure being with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for all your support. As always, thank you for your questions. Thank you for, for watching what we do and believing in our product. I just want to say thank you to you, Rebecca and the rest of your team in Final Control. And to everyone else that makes this product what it is. And uh, I hope wherever you are in the world that you have a good day if you're still approaching the evening. And if you are about to go to sleep, sleep tight. We will be seeing you again in the morning, uh, bright and early. Um, I think we are leaving here at 6.30 again tomorrow morning for 9.30. And if Brent is capable of standing after his gorilla trek with his gammy hip, We'll try and get Brent into the driving seat so he can tell you all about the gorilla experience that he have, that he has had. I'm about to interrogate him along with the rest of the staff here and absolutely wanting to find out what he got up to over there. So can't wait to get him in front of the camera for you so that he can relate what he got up to over the last couple of days. Life-changing experience visiting gorillas. Every single person I've ever spoken to ever has always come back, changed for the better after having something like that. All right, so we're going to say goodbye. Jamie wants to say goodbye to you as well. We'll catch up with you in the morning. Have a nice day. <laughs> and I would also like to say goodbye, but I'm not going to say goodbye just yet. We've still got a few more precious seconds in which we must try and find this lion that I heard roaring from somewhere around Treehouse Dam area. Oh, we're going to bump our way down this road. Sorry, Dave. Dave's still on the back, I think. I can't really tell because the presenter light is in my face. So I don't know 100% if Dave is still there. Are you still there, Dave? Still here. Yay! Bravo! Should we get you a, um, a walking stick for your grievous injury that you acquired this morning? <laughs> Dave, of course, bravely tried to move a thorn tree today and um, it resulted in some very serious injuries. Not that serious injuries. No, Dave's been very stoic about it. And so, unfortunately, I think unless this lion is around this corner, which he is not, I think we have come to the end of our sunset safari and it is time for us to do our farewells and our many, many thank you. Thank you to Dave. And Jerry and Chelsea. And I'd like to just say on behalf of everyone, a big thank you to Steph for his drives over the last few days. It's been absolutely wonderful driving with him. And most marvelously, thank you to all of you watching across the globe, wherever you may be. 
I hope that you have a fantastic day and that you're all excited about the gorilla tails because I know I am. We will catch you tomorrow on the Sunrise Safari. Bye bye everybody. I'm scared the car's going to move too much and we're... Okay, he's found his way around.